thanks for having me along. I'm from Urban Utilities. When I joined Urban Utilities a couple of years ago, which is the wonderful world of sewage and water here in Brisbane, safety wasn't in a great state. So the CEO and the board and the executive, they were very frustrated with their relationship with the safety team. And when I joined the safety team, the conversation really centered around things like um, how much yellow tape exactly should be put on the footpath outside the depot? Why wouldn't the guys roll down their sleeves? I mean, it is 35 degrees outside and they're working in water. And exactly which hard hat should be worn out in the field. When the safety team would rock up on site, the guys would tend to duck for cover. The relationship really wasn't great in the business. So even though there was a lot of frustration within the business, I saw this as a really great opportunity to come in and to influence the strategic safety direction of the business. So fast forwarding about two to three years on to today, I can say that it's been a great journey. We've had a, a huge amount of challenges, huge amount of things that haven't worked and uh, certainly a lot of things that have worked and that have landed along the way. So here's a little uh, snapshot, a little taster of what our journey's been like over the last couple of years. Safety differently, great idea. But the question that comes up is, how do we do this? How do we implement it? How do we apply safety differently? Here's a story. It's a story of Kim and her organization and how they decluttered their bureaucracy, their safety systems, how they decentralize decisions from headquarters to the places where work actually gets done and how they devolve decision authority and empower people who actually do the work. This is an amazing story. It is hugely inspiring. But people will say, this cannot be done, not in my organization. I have important stakeholders to keep happy. How can that work? Well, are you in for a surprise? I just love Sydney's comment there. Boy, are you in for a surprise? I did wonder though, perhaps it's like, you know when you see a movie trailer and then you see the actual movie and it's never really as good as the trailer? <laughs> oh, I know, I know. So if you go and watch the documentary and you think that, please do not tell me. Maybe you could tell Sid, but don't tell me. I don't want to know, okay? Yeah, tell the producers, yeah, blame them. But certainly that's our uh, Doing Safety Differently documentary that we collaborated with Sydney Decker on last year. We had a lot of fun producing it. You can see it at Sydney's YouTube channel. So today what I want to do is just take you through the highlights reel of what we've done, what has worked and what hasn't worked over the last couple of years. Certainly you can watch the doco uh, <laughs> afterwards as well. So, oh, let's go back. So one of the first things I did walking into Urban Utilities was to establish, uh, I stole John Green, you know, John Green from Lango Rock, his term about uh, establishing a compelling case for change. So I don't think it's enough to take this theory to your business and say, hey, let's roll this out, let's do this. That's not going to be enough for your, your board and your executives and your stakeholders. So what I did was I took all of our injury data, I, took, uh, I did a desktop review of our safety management system, I did extensive stakeholder consultation from the blunt end to the sharp end to find out what people's challenges were uh, working at Open Utilities with safety, what really frustrated them, what all of their successes were over the last eight years, and what their vision was for safety. So I took all of that together, uh, mixed it all up. I took all of the contemporary safety science research from Eric, from Sydney, from Dave. Uh, and what I did was I produced an ironclad case that I could take to the board and present to them about why we should take a different strategic direction with safety. Uh, now, I've got to say, it made perfect sense to them, as Eric said, you know, really, it's hard to refute. So they, they loved it, there was unanimous acceptance of that, and we rapidly got sign-off. But, of course, it's never that easy, right? I make it sound easy, but it's not. Along the way, there are a few of the usual suspects that reared their head. And what I'm talking about here is, uh, I think what Sid, uh, Eric uh, touched on before, which was really those assumptions and those beliefs that we hold about safety, which we haven't really tested out to see whether they're true or not, they're not based on any evidence, but they certainly hinder our thinking along the way. So I call these uh, sacred cows. And a sacred cow is an idea or a belief or a custom that's held above any criticism. So it's the dogmatic thinking that's pervaded our industry, and we don't really check and stop and see whether it's actually correct. So the big sacred cows that I quickly identified early on during sign-off and even after sign-off, uh, the first one there is our legal cow the legal ones. So the assumption here is if we change anything at all in safety, 
then something will go wrong and we'll be in a less legally compromised position. Someone from the board is going to go to jail. If we stop documenting our risk assessments, someone's going to end up in jail. It's going to be Louise Dudley, our CEO for sure. The second one there, the uh, metric cow. So again, the assumption being that TRIFA and LTIFR are the best measures to predict safety performance. And then the last one there, the king daddy, the culture cow, my favorite. I can't kill this one, I don't know if you have. But the assumption here is, is that people are the problem to control. If it wasn't for those pesky people with their bad safety behaviors, then we wouldn't be having incidents and high potential near misses. Now that one there, I love him because he is, this is an assumption that pervades a lot of the conversations in the boardroom when something goes wrong. It's still there, that assumption that people were the problem. And it's also the underlying tone of a lot of our policies and procedures as well. So I can still see it running through our organization. So what I did was I identified these sacred cows I presented them and I opened up the conversation in the boardroom to effectively slay them. But I did that by presenting the research behind why these assumptions were not correct and why they're holding us back. So I presented information to say, well, actually, by moving to safety differently and using safety two, it will actually put us in a better legal position than we were previously. And I presented the research to say, well, actually, TRIFRA and LTIFR aren't a good predictor of our safety performance. So if you're presenting a compelling case for change to your board about why you want to do this, my suggestion would be to identify what these assumptions are in your business and start to use the research effectively to uh, start to challenge them. So we had sign off, we killed some sacred cows. The next thing we did was to do an extensive process of discovery, a deep dive into work as it actually happens. So everything that Eric's talking about normal everyday work. Now, I don't know about you, but I certainly didn't have time to go out and do this discovery all on my own. So I partnered with Griffith University Safety Science Innovation Lab, Yop over there. You give us, everyone knows Yop Vinga, hopefully. So Yop went out and did a three month ethnography study. So Yop became a water industry worker, a sewage treatment operator, a lab worker for three months. He was out there in the rain and the heat, thank you Yop. Uh, helping the guys with the burst water mains and whatnot, observing everyday work. And what Yop was able to discover for us was all the trade-offs, the constraints, the degraded conditions that our guys work in, the way in which our guys create and break safety day in, day out. Now, Yop, thankfully, uh, condensed all of that into a beautiful report for us, and we were able to use that rich data set to inform our priorities going forward for our strategy. So I cannot uh, recommend doing some kind of process of discovery. If you don't have time to do it yourself, obviously there's uh, uh, exceptional people like Yop who are really good at studying normal work who can assist you with that. So I had that information, so I then went back to uh, our key stakeholders to get strategic. So we were at the end of a safety strategy uh, life cycle, so it was time to set the next three year strategy. So together we co-designed and collaborated on the next three year strategy with safety two as the basis for our health and safety strategy. And I must say that also, um, it also relates 100% to health and wellbeing as well, so not just safety. So here is a nice little visual of um, the strategy. So there's a much detailed version that exists underneath that, of course. So you can see we have our outcomes for success there. We have, I don't know if you can read that at the back, there's a bunch of initiatives and things that we started to do. That's an old list. Um, a lot of those, a few of those things have been completed or come off the list and new things have been added on. Uh, but you can see our discovery, our design, our implementation, and then moving toward the outcomes. So the part that I wanted to highlight though was that second part there, the design and implement. So if you want your people to know about this theory, then obviously, uh, it makes sense obviously, to tell them about it, but to give them the opportunity to hear the theory, to pull it apart, to debate it, and to actually put it into practice. So I wrote a four-day bespoke program uh, that took Eric and Sydney's theory, Dave's theory, and all of the methodologies and tools that we created off the back of that theory, and then we took the leaders through that particular training. So I didn't expect people to leave their old assumptions behind. I just said to them, hey, be curious about this. Go out there and give some of this stuff a go, and then come back and tell us how you went with it. So that training was hugely successful. Uh, we're still rolling it out with our delivery partners now, and I think it's really helped the business to understand 
uh, our new strategic direction and actually start to put this into practice for themselves. Now what was interesting at the end of each training program, I would get one or two people, or maybe more, come up to me and say, hey Kim, love the training. I love what you're talking about. This is exactly what I've been thinking about in safety for years. I just didn't know how to articulate it. So I would call those people the early adopters. Does anyone have those in their organisation? The people who go, yeah, I love this. I want to be part of it. One person does great. Uh, <laughs> yay. So, uh, uh, so John Cotter, he talks about uh, change management and the eight stages. And one of those stages in doing any change management is to establish a guiding coalition. So this is our guiding coalition. Except that sounds really boring, right? So we called it the vanguard. So the vanguard means the group of people who are going forward and putting new ideas into practice. So these people, we uh, pulled them together, we formed them, we gave them a name. And then we started to bring in other thought leaders like Dave Prover and Drew Ray to help expand their knowledge. So these are people who don't have those biases, who don't have those assumptions about safety. They're just willing to get in and give it a go. So what we found was they, after we gave them more knowledge, they're like, well, we want to go out there and put this into action. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I'm not really ready for this, but okay, let's do it. So uh, with Drew's help, we started to design micro experiments with them. So one of our successful micro-experiments that's been rolled out through the whole business is starting to move from written risk assessments for basic and routine tasks to a guided conversation risk assessment. I know and I can tell you all shocked, our business is shocked as well, it's been very hard for them to understand how we're going to remove that piece of paper, but um, we certainly have been successful in doing that. Now I'll make the point that you can see, except for that guy there, Michael Zinn, everyone's having a great time, right? So <laughs> we want safety to be fun as well. Um, and certainly it's a great group, very enthusiastic, and uh, we've had a lot of runs on the board. So yeah, my suggestion would be if you've got those early adopters in the business who are really passionate and enthusiastic, then certainly uh, harness that energy. Okay, so there was a question I think from Conrad before, well what does this actually look like? So we've got the business on board, we've got the vanguard on board, we've got a whole bunch of challenges that YOPS identified for us and we've picked up along the way. So now, what are those initiatives, what does this actually look like when we put it into practice? Now, I have a much longer list than those five up there, but I'm just going to talk about those five because I've only got two minutes left now. Um, so the first one is decluttering, which uh, I think Dave's already spoken about or will be speaking about today. So we've started to declutter all of the pointless bureaucracy from our safety management system. So around five years ago, we had an enforceable undertaking where we thought it'd be a really great idea as, you know, in, in, in dealing with that to throw everything into our safety management system. So the result has been a bloated safety management system that is completely ineffectual, that no one reads. I still get shocked when I find another document. Oh, I haven't even heard of this one. So we've started to go through that methodical process. It's a long process of decluttering it. Uh, the guys in the field love this process. They love it when we come out and we start to make things uh, more viable for them and actually create operational safety as opposed to hinder it. The second one there, safety metrics. So we've removed TRIFRA and LTIFR from our, our vocab, so we no longer report on that. A lot of people say to me, well, Kim, well, if you're not reporting on that, what are you reporting on? So I've mapped everything back, similar to what Eric was talking about. I think Eric's answered this question for everybody already, really. Um, so I've mapped everything back to our due diligence requirements, which is similar to Eric's model there. Um, and people said to me, Kim, well, show us what you've done, okay? And I, I'd probably ask the same question, to be honest. But really, what I've done in my organisation will not be the metrics that you should be using in your organisation. So my suggestion would be is to cast the net really wide, use Eric's theories, Sydney's, cast the wide net wide on all of the metrics that are out there, the contemporary lead ones, the traditional lag ones, then take that to your board and ask them, what are the decisions that you're trying to make as a board to fulfil your due diligence requirements and then what is the data that you need to make those decisions? And then design that together with them as a collaborative experience, because that's going to be a lot more meaningful to them and easier for you in, uh, in moving away from TRIFRA and LTIFR. The third one there, critical control work insights. So um, again, taking that idea of work as imagined, work as done. We now go out there to study normal work. We have a process, it's different to safety observations, obviously. Um, it's a lot more meaningful based on normal work around our high-risk work activities. That's been a little bit slow to get off the ground, but it's creating a data set for us that's much more proactive that we're using uh, in our reporting as well. 
I'm sure everyone's familiar with learning teams. If not, um, go and speak to, to Mark and Andy. Um, so we have moved away from those surface root cause human error type investigations and we've adopted learning teams, not just for investigations, but also for just coming up with uh, solutions to challenges as well. And that's been massively successful for us. And then the last one there, restorative culture. So we've moved away from a blame culture to a culture of trust and learning and accountability. And if you haven't read Sydney's books on restorative culture, then you're missing out because this has been huge for our business. Recently, someone came to me and they said, Kim, we haven't been breaching anyone for safety lately. <laughs> I'm winning, great. I said, yeah, okay, I know. And the reason is, is because we don't need to anymore. We've moved away from that culture of fear and punishment. And I know that this has been a success because I now have people in the field putting up their hands and volunteering their safety violations. I don't think that, would, that definitely didn't happen three years ago because they probably would have got sacked for it. But now they're telling us about it to say, hey, actually, we were out one night and this is what we did. Okay, and they're coming up with the solutions for it. We're able to have an adult open conversation about the systemic factors that led to that violation. So all of those obviously have implementation plans beneath them and a considerable amount of work goes into those particular uh, things that we've been doing. Thank you. Uh, second, lastly, we've also undergone a branding exercise. So this is probably a little bit deviating from what we've been talking about from the theory over the last day and a half. But certainly we wanted to give safety a slightly better brand than what it currently has. So if you were to Google safety, um, what you're going to find is images that are orange and black, images of fear, compliance and hazards. Yet if you Google sustainability, you're going to see colours like blue and green, you're going to see pictures of hope and a future and opportunity. So if that's what people think about safety in general in society, then what are people going to think as a safety professional when you turn up to talk to them, okay? So if we're doing safety differently, we want them to think about safety differently. So we underwent a uh, rebranding activity where we added the blue and the green in, along with the orange. Uh, we removed zero harm and we now talk about capacity and resilience and reliability. And we removed the safety rhetoric of safety first and safety is the number one priority. And we replaced it with things like safe production, safe installation, safe maintenance, so on and so forth. And now when we turn up to speak to people, we're less about advocating our position and telling them. And we're inquiring more and asking questions and starting to influence them. So what that's done is it's moved us from a vocab of fear and deficit and control and compliance to talking about empowerment, what that actually means, talking about human opportunity, so on and so forth. And last of all, because I have gone over time. Oh, oh, thank you. Okay. So in summary, like I said at the start, the trailer is sometimes a little bit better than the movie. So I don't want it to seem like it's been hugely successful. So we have had success, but it has been challenging along the way. There's absolutely no doubt about it. Happy to share those learnings over a drink sometime because I've got plenty of them that I can share for you. But it really is so much more than saying, OK, I'll have what she's having because every organisation is different. So if you're serious about doing safety too and safety differently, my suggestion would be is to really get stuck in and to read the literature that is out there. So read widely, read resilience engineering, HOP, safety two, safety differently, action science, action research, human factors, read it all. Listen to all the podcasts that are out there. If you don't know Andrew Barrett's podcast and you've got at least a year's worth of great listening, Dave and Drew's podcast, they take all the research for you and present it back and actually apply it for you. It's fantastic. I don't know if Ben Hutchinson's here today, but he on LinkedIn posts all that great research with little snippets. So it's really easy to start to absorb this information. So once you've got that, I would take that back to your business, start to drip feed it in, let them debate it and pull it apart, um, start to listen to what their objections are. Someone before mentioned about, uh, I think it was Vanessa, you made a great comment about looking at this from all the stakeholder perspectives. And that's really what it's about, looking at the system as a whole, thinking about how this applies to their stakeholder perspective, how it applies to the whole entire organisation. And of course, uh, to my point there, many minds are always better than one. So we've got a conference here of 90 people. That's a massive network of people that you can tap into 
to draw on ideas, share learnings, share war stories and whatnot. So if you haven't done so already, I would certainly be tapping into that, uh, that network. So um, I'd like to thank everyone so much for your time today and for listening. Thanks so much to Dave Proven for having me along. Hope you enjoy the rest of the great speakers. We've got Josh up next, so um, thank you so much. Questions for Kim?